Good morning, church family. This is Eddie Maines, and I'm here to tell you your announcements this morning. First off, save the date for Holy Chow. On March 16th, everyone is invited to the Casual Worship Center to attend Holy Chow, which is just a monthly luncheon for our church family to get to know each other better. This is a great time for fellowship and delicious food. The cost is only $5 and payable at the door. Stay tuned for more information. Next up is Car Church, a new community outreach for our single moms and widows. We'll be doing free checkups on cars, which includes checking tire pressure, oil change, and fluid levels while our guests enjoy fellowship and refreshments. Remember, Saturday, March 19th, in the Casual Worship Center parking lot from 7.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. by appointment only. So to make that appointment or volunteer, contact Will Starkey at wstarkey at broadmoormethodist.org or you can call the church office at 924-6269. For questions about these events or anything else, feel free to look at our website, which is broadmoormethodist.org or you can find us in the Connection Cafe on Sunday mornings and we'd love to talk to you. Have a great week. Welcome to our online contemporary service. I'm Amber, this is Eric, and we're so excited to be worshiping with y'all. I just want to invite you to sing these next couple songs with us. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high. Valley love, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. God is for me, He's not against me. I will hope to plant tears for me. And when I'm broken, He will fix me. I will call on.
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out the power and love, as we sing holy, 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 open the eyes of my heart, Lord. My heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love, we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power. Good morning, church family. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for bringing us together on a Sunday to be with you and to say goodbye to the week past and to welcome the week ahead. As we prepare our hearts for the message today, Lord, we just ask you to continue to open our hearts, our minds, open up the eyes to see our faith, to feel our faith, and to truly be able to go to those who need to see hope, to feel hope, so that we can continue to live in your son's example. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Kenan. I'm here with Eric and Amber, and we're excited to bring you a message of good news from the Gospels. We're in our series called The Gospel According to. We're going to look at an interesting story. Um, believe it or not, this is our last week in Matthew, uh, Matthew 17, and we're going to be reading from the message today. But before we get started, I just want to ask you about this particular passage because it's one that's kind of, uh, I think most people who uh, have been around discussions surrounding the Bible have heard of it, but it's not a real widely understood uh, topic, and that is transfiguration. What do you think of when you hear the word the transfiguration? Transfiguration. Uh, I'm just gonna shoot off the cuff here and I think it has something to do with the uh, ideology of Jesus being both God and man, maybe? I'm going to give this guy some, like, Bible treasure or something. He did really good. That's why good. He went Is that his? That's, that's part of it. That's, the, uh, that's definitely an aspect for sure. Yeah. We're in the ballpark. Yeah. yeah. Top that, Amber. I can't. That's why he went first. <laughs> he got me. I don't even know how to do it, to be honest. Okay, my message is done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think on that, like, transforming, yes. whether it be, like, physically back then, yes. them seeing something, something big happening, yeah. or um, spiritually Yes. Going on what he says into, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. so these are great. You guys did amazing. I give you both A pluses. Our worship leaders are the best here at Broadmoor. I just want you to know that. And uh, I'm, I'm not even kidding. I, I really think these guys are amazing and good leaders. But I want to tell you that this transfiguration uh, discussion is kind of understood what it means. And, it, and, you, and we'll get to that as we unpack it because it is a little complicated. And it really just reminds us how crazy the times were that Jesus was in, like how much misinformation and all that uh, stuff was out there. Uh, but before we get there, many of you may know that I love art. I'm an artist, I paint, I do things that, uh, that are in the art world, and so I really um, love art. And I wanted to talk to you about why the gospel is good news and what good news versus bad news is. And so there was this gallery owner, and um, he, um, he had uh, talked to one of his artists and he was telling his artist, I've got some good news and some bad news. And of course the artist was like, well, you know, just give me the good news first. And he said, well, the good news is that, that we had this client stop by this week and they had asked about um, whether or not your art would be worth more after you were dead. And so, of course, I told them the truth and said, well, yeah, I mean, every artist art is worth more after they're dead. And so uh, the good news is that, that client went and they bought every single uh, piece of yours in the gallery today. And so the artist was like, wow. He goes, well, you, you want the bad news? And he goes, well, what could be bad after that? And he goes, well, the client was your doctor. <laughs> so <laughs> so I just wanted to explain that there, you know, it's a difference between um, good news and bad news. <laughs> Jesus' message was supposed to be good news for everybody. And yet, a lot of times Jesus' good news was not good news for everybody. Some people felt very threatened by it, and it didn't feel like good news. And so I just wanted to throw that out as a reminder to us that good news does require perspective. And um, a lot happens after Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is where we have uh, been the last couple of weeks. First of all, John the Baptist. Do you remember John the Baptist? He was the one who was preg uh, who was uh, in Elizabeth's belly uh, back in Advent. We talked about uh, how Jesus uh, and John John leapt in in, Mar in uh, Elizabeth's womb as uh, because he knew that he was in the presence of God while Jesus was in Mary's womb. So John the Baptist um, uh, he had criticized this fellow named Herod Antipas, and Herod Antipas was the ruler in the area around the. Sea of Galilee at the time, and um, he had criticized him for marrying his brother's wife. So he he and, and it, it was not uh, taken well by Herod Antipas. He he actually wanted John dead, but he was very afraid of a revolt of the people who was in his uh, you know uh, in his charge, and so he was very wor uh, worried that they would uprise against him if he did anything to John, because the people at the time really considered John the Baptist as a prophet. Now remember, they had not heard from a prophet in 400 years, so to go against one would be uh, terrible. Well, at a dinner 
party one night at Herod, uh, Herod of Antipas's, uh, or Herod Antipas's um, uh, kingdom. Uh, he was having this party and his stepdaughter, Salome, this is the daughter of the person he married, um, she danced for him and all of his guests. And in a drunken stupor, he promises her anything that she wants up to half of his own kingdom uh, as a reward for the amazing uh, show that she puts on. And so Salome talks to her mother, uh, Herodias, and, uh, and, and says, what should I ask for? And Herodias, you know, being, of course, one of the, the people that was subject to John the Baptist's criticism, said, ask for John the Baptist's head. And so, literally, John the Baptist's head gets served up to Salome on a silver platter, right, at this, at this event. And so, Herod of Antipas becomes very, very uh, paranoid after that. And so, he actually looks at Jesus Christ as John the Baptist returned from the dead right? So he's that paranoid. And so it is just adding more and more to the confusion and the chaos and all of the mess that's going on around Jesus and his ministry. Now, Peter, one of Jesus's disciples, had become convinced that Jesus was in fact the son of God. And so he has proclaimed that now. And right before this passage that we're about to read, Peter does this amazing thing, steps out of a boat and walks on water with Jesus. Now he sinks when he takes his eyes off Jesus, but he comes back when he keeps his eyes on <clears throat> Jesus. And so this is all about faith, but he's proclaimed Jesus to be the son of God. But then you add on top of that, Jesus' brand new prediction. It's going to be the first of three where Jesus predicts his own suffering, death, and glorification post-resurrection at the hands of the religious leaders and the Roman government. And we arrive at this passage today, which Christian tradition does refer to as the transfiguration. So I want you to listen now as we hear what happened with Jesus just six days after this first prediction of his own death um, with his disciples present, his disciples, <clears throat> Peter, James, and John, and they are in the natural world. And then we also see two deceased prophets, Moses and Elijah, who were alive but were in the spiritual realm. Listen to what happens. Six days later, three of them saw the glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Peter broke in, Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I built three memorials here on the mountain? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was going on like this, babbling, a light radiant cloud enveloped them and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice. This is my son, marked by my love, focus of, of my delight. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. <clears throat> don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. Coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't breathe a word of what you've seen. After the Son of Man is raised from the dead, you are free to talk. The disciples, meanwhile, were asking questions. Why do the religion scholars say that Elijah has to come first? Jesus answered, Elijah does come and get everything ready. I'm telling you, Elijah has already come, but they didn't know him when they saw him. They treated him like dirt, the same way they are about to treat the Son of Man. That's when the disciples realized all along he had been talking about John the Baptizer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this threshold moment. Help us, God, to to unpack it, God, and to see it more clearly. Give us your eyes, Lord, um, to see this scripture and how it might impact our lives. And we ask that in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your spirit, amen. amen. So, you know, so much chaos going on at this time. 
the environment that all of this is going down in with Jesus and his disciples was one of misinformation. It was one of misinterpretation. It was definitely one of miscommunication. And all of those things, these misunderstandings and so forth, they were the norm. We saw it in the Beatitudes, right, that we talked about in week one, where uh, Jesus had to redefine for them, hashtag blessed, remember that? And then we saw it again in the discussion that Jesus had with his disciples in the crowds about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, where he dismisses the lie that the bigger the better, and he offers hope in the good news that hinges on our humility and on our willingness to be uplifting to all people. Chaos, misinformation, misunderstanding, misinterpretation. You have to understand that the value of any clarity in this moment whatsoever was at its very highest price in, at any other time in all of human history. It was that bad there. And I wonder if that kind of setting rings a bell or two. Does it sound familiar? Do, do you see it in our own world? How can Russia and China and Ukraine and the USA and other countries of the world watch the same world events unfold and yet have such different understandings of what is actually taking place? Now that's politics. What about religion? How can non-believers and believers both experience life such uh, drastically <laughs> different uh, worldviews and takeaways um, that each one of them have? How, how can we do that? How can within uh, the, the people of faith, how, how can Jews and Muslims and Christians and, uh, and how can they all worship the same God and yet still have such different beliefs and practices in which they honor God. What do you think? What do you think about that? How can we, how can we be so different? Man, that's a really big, big question. But like, I just feel like it's, um, it's, uh, well, I'm not going to say what it's like a, a lack of, because I feel like it's something that we all struggle with, obviously. But I'm going to say, I feel if there was more compassion and understanding for other people's um, lifestyles, traditions, cultures, you know, um, family values, things that are held sacred to individual people in different societies and cultures and races and religions and all that, if there was more compassion and understanding about those differences, then maybe we would see more of the same. Yeah, absolutely. Instead of just seeing the differences and having those things divide us. What about you, Amber? You, you, you lead worship in a room full of a, one of the most diverse crowds probably in, in anywhere in Baton Rouge worshiping on a Sunday morning. Like what, what do you say to this? Kind of going on like what Eric says, I think it's good to be different. I think different is a beautiful thing, and it can be a beautiful thing if you take the time to understand. I think in bigger things, people automatically think, you don't think like me, you're wrong. Mm. You don't look like me, you're wrong. You don't act like me, you're mm. wrong. And so going on like the compassion thing and the understanding thing, I feel like pride is a big thing. Mm. I feel like personal things um, and views are a big thing that stand in the way. I think. Being different or people viewing different things is a really beautiful thing. Mm. It's just about how you personally want to accept that or understand that or take the time to unpack that. Mm. I love that. Thank you. I'm telling you, best worship leaders in town right here, right here. That's all you need to know. But the same thing holds true for Catholics and Methodists and Baptists and Pentecostals. You know, we differ so much on our understandings and on our takeaways from Scripture. And then you get even within our own denomination and you've got traditionalists and compatibilists and progressives who all hold different uh, views so much to the point there is even discussion about denominational splits and things like that. But again, I really think that we can relate to this world of chaos and misinformation and misinterpretation interpretation and misunderstanding and and all of that because friends I believe that's our norm too I really do 
And that's why the mountaintop at the Transfiguration was so attractive. It really is. It was an attractive place to be. Any place of clarity amidst all of that chaos that was going on, it is absolutely no wonder that no one wants to come down off this mountain. They want to stay there, right? And I feel like we do that also. There is Peter, James, and John, and they're getting real clear on this revelation of who Jesus is. And as it unfolds right before their eyes, clearly uh, in what you were saying, you know, fully human and fully divine. He's operating in both of these worlds. He's even having a discussion with Elijah and with Moses at the same time. He's having discussions with them. And so they're getting clear so much to the point that they're like, let's don't even come down off this mountain. I tell you what, let's just hang out and build some huts up here. I'll build three of them, one for you, one for you, one for you. I'll just stay up here, right? And hang out. It reminds me of bubbles, like us skidding in our groups, right? In these bubbles that we create in our life. You know, they didn't want to go back down to the storminess down there in that valley. They wanted to stay up in the clarity of that mountain. I don't want you, you know, <laughs> up here clouding my bubble, you know? I want to stay in it. I, I want to build huts and altars where I can feel clear. I, I, wanna, I want all of the clarity that I see in the view and the vantage point that I have right up here on the mountaintop. I, I want my happy place where everything is easy and, and known, right? <laughs> and, and that there is no suffering. But here's the challenge for these disciples, and I believe it's our challenge to the road to Christ's prediction, the road to his death on a cross, the road to his dead body being anointed with burial spices and placed into a borrowed tomb. The road to resurrection on Easter morning, the road to Jesus's ascension into heaven and his reappearance here on earth to his disciples, the road to Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, to appearing at our communion table, the road to Jerusalem where God's promise for a restored creation through acts of reconciliation were to be kept. And Jesus' prediction of the passion was the key to its fulfillment. That road was down in the valley. It was down in the valley, not up there on that mountain. We love the clarity of the mountaintop. We do. So much that we either like to remain there in our bubbles or, or we like to be the ones who come down and tell everybody what we experienced there in our mountaintop moment and how enlightened we are. And we want to come down and make everybody else's business our business and tell them, you know, how we interpret their lives and what they should and should not be doing. And instead of, you know, letting the live out in the chaos of the valley and pretending like we know it all. But is that what Jesus did? And is that what the disciples ended up doing? They neither remained on the mountain, nor did they come down to enlighten others about what happened there. In fact, Jesus forbid them to even talk about it until after his own resurrection. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't need mountaintop experiences. We all most certainly do need mountaintop experiences. These are the times where we are challenged to grow personally, spiritually, professionally, relationally. They are those times of challenge to grow us and to help us to gain a greater understanding. These are the times where God pulls near to us you can almost bet any time the Bible says somebody's going up in a mountain, God's going to be up there with them. For Peter, James, and John, who had been asked to drop everything and to just cast down their, their nets and their boats and pick up everything, uh, which was nothing, the clothes on their back, and follow this Jesus guy, who had probably experienced some real hard times and some deep questioning in their own person about who they are and what they were doing, they had to have some insecurities, some moments where they were like, what am I doing with this guy? What have I done following him? 
this mountaintop moment, that would have been affirming for them. It would have been worth it for the decisions that they made. They wanted to stay in that I feel so good place. <laughs> Who could blame them, right? I mean, we've been there. Some of us, when we came to our faith in Jesus, if you, if you believe in, in Jesus and you come there, you've probably had some kind of mountaintop moment. <clears throat> but behind all of this, then there's this talk of the cross. The disciples knew what those crosses were. They had seen them on the roads going into Jerusalem. They, they had seen them lining up the roads. They knew that it was Romans' last ditch effort to maintain control and power over the people, to extort themselves over the people, to, to make sure that the people that they knew who was in charge. And they knew that the road that they must travel was a road of tangible and great suffering. And they knew when they came down off of that mountain, that's the road they were gonna travel. And similarly, we as Christians know that when we follow Jesus, when we sign up for a life of service and acts of reconciliation and justice, that's a hard road. It's much easier to stay in our bubbles. And even as Christians, we find ways to do that, sitting in our Sunday school classrooms week after week and never doing anything outside of that, or attending our worship services, or sticking around in our bands with our music group and everything, but never going out and serving beyond that. We'd rather stay there and build our huts, right, and stay in those places that feel good. And then we look at God and we say, man, Please don't make me go back down there into the valley. Please. I'd much rather you send me down there to enlighten everyone. That's, that's a lot easier, right? One who comes down from the mountain of high places, of, of clear understanding. Let me be that person, right? Charged with making everybody else see it the way that I do. That's, that's what we want. They can just have faith that it is all that I said it was supposed to be, right? That's what creates all the division. But then Jesus' resurrection is what actually does the talking in this story. Jesus doesn't let them go and be the enlighteners. Jesus like, don't say anything until after my body's been raised. So it's the resurrection of Christ that actually tells the thing that's most important to tell. You mean the action of, of your all-knowing, all-seeing, overcoming of sin and death versus my high level of understanding and my limited view off of a mountaintop is, is better? <laughs> but where's the excitement for that for me? And what about the privilege that I would enjoy as one of the few who got to go up there and see your light and your eyes and everything change and all of that? What about the security I felt in your presence up there on the mountain, God? What about my own peace and tranquility in the closeness that we shared? The truth is it's scary down there in the valley. It's scary. The road to Jerusalem, it's... It's lined with scary reminders. The unknown that the disciples were about to head into, it was terrifying. What God is asking us to do and leaving the safety and the surety of our little bubbles is sometimes terrifying too. The valley is a scary place. But what if Martin Luther King never came down from the mountaintop to help put an end to racial injustice. He recalled God as an inner voice telling him to do what was right, knowing that from that point on, God did have his hand on him and therefore gave him all of the courage that he needed to face his fears head on. That was his own words. God doesn't give us mountaintop experiences to make us feel good or superior to others. God gives us mountaintop experiences to change the way we see the world and ourselves. Only then can we become agents of change and become the world transformers that God has made us to be. 
in Christ. The transfiguration where three disciples and Jesus had an epiphany, it was a threshold moment that signaled that a new day was on the way in Jesus Christ. God was moving God's beloved children towards community, towards the kingdom of God, towards the kingdom of heaven, both on earth and as it was in heaven, as evidenced in Elijah and in Moses. It is the beloved community that Martin Luther Jr., Martin Luther King Jr. died for, gave his life for. And just like God opened the eyes of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., God is opening our eyes too. You can't go back from what has God has done in enlightening you up on the mountain, but you can go down off of your mountain. You can come out of your bubbles and you can go and be a healing presence in a hurting world. And you can work for peace and injustice despite the enormity of what that actually means. And you can offer hope to the hopeless. That is the work of a true Christian. That is the good news that the world is hungry for. We don't have to explain, friends, what we saw on the mountain. That just leads to more chaos and more misinterpretation and more misunderstanding and division. But what we can do is tell everyone about God's purpose in Jesus Christ to make all things new. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have unanswered prayers. I have trouble I wish wasn't there. And I have asked a thousand Take my pain away. But you would take my pain away. I am trying to understand. Oh, how off this weary land makes read the past that crooked lie. Oh, Lord, before these feet of mine. Oh, Holy.
There are many ways that you can give toward the mission of Broadmoor. You can go to broadmoormethodist.org slash giving to give safely and securely online. You can text BE MORE to 73256. And of course, you can also mail checks to our physical address at 10230 Molly Lee Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana 70815.